Um, well, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> so it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, next speaker uh, for this session, uh, Professor Xiaoli Meng from Harvard. Uh, so uh, Xiaoli is the Whipple Jones Professor of Statistics at Harvard University. And uh, up until relatively recently, he was the uh, Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. And prior to that, the uh, Chair of the Department of Statistics at Harvard. And he received his PhD in Statistics at Harvard. And um, before joining the faculty, spent about 10 years at the University of Chicago. Um, he's worked very broadly in statistics, and I think that's going to be reflected in some of his talk today, with interests ranging from theoretical foundations of inference to computational statistics to applications in social sciences, medicine, uh, medical sciences, and engineering and beyond, um, and has received a number of awards and, and sort of honorary elections. He's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, was president of the Institute for Mathematical Statistics. Uh, is a fellow of the IMS and a fellow of the American Statistical Association and many other things, too numerous to mention. Um, also, he's currently the uh, founding editor-in-chief of the Harvard Data Science Review, uh, which is a really lively and exciting journal, one that I've enjoyed very much myself, um, illuminating many current questions in our field, and I think that's keeping him pretty busy these days. Um, so in, I'm just very delighted that he could come and speak at SDSCon today, and I think without further ado, I'd just like to give him the floor, so shall we, please. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, like many of you, uh, this is the first time after two years lockdown that uh, uh, I feel alive to uh, have this opportunity to talk to all of you. And uh, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me, but also want to say that the organizers are very brave. Uh, first, they organized uh, you know, conference dinner before the conference. So I felt like I don't even have to show up you know, if the dinner was not good. Uh, but dinner was great, so I did decide to show up. Second is they arranged, I, in case you have not noticed, they arranged this conference on the April Fool's Day. Uh, <laughs> so you never know like things like this, whether this, did I really change the title, or this is just an April Fool's joke. Uh, so I would let you to, to, uh, you know, to decide. Uh, well, seriously, this is actually, that depends on which audience I give, I have two different titles. This is the title I give to the more broad audience, uh, even then I switch bait, talk series, but you know, it's fine. Uh, but, but seriously, that this, uh, um, I uh, start to think about this line work really about 10 years ago, uh, when this notion of personalized medicine or personalized education, personalized news become, you know, gets popular. And I ask myself as a statistician, what does it really mean? Like, you know, I know what the, uh, you know, uh, medical field, right, whenever they have a, a, you know, new treatment, you do clinical trials. Uh, you know, clinical trials basically you assign a group of people randomly to one treatment, assign another group to a different treatment. In the end, you compare these two groups. You, you decide which group has a little bit higher, you know, uh, you know uh, efficacy in terms of the treatment. Then you declare, if you can, uh, lucky enough to pass the FDS approval, that the medication or treatment will be, uh, you know, available for others, right? But all the promises is say it works on average for some group. Well, how would that translate to whether it worked for me or not, right? Because this whole notion of personalized medicine is, at least in some hyperdiversion, is a hyperdiversion is really trying to say, hey, I have some, I have some treatment that actually really works for you. And that got me very curious. Like how, how can we ever think about cumulated statistical evidence for these things for you? Because obviously I cannot collect data on you before I promise you. Right? So that's how I initially started to think about this, this line of work. I use this title. Probably you, you, you can see how I try to attract the audience because that is a real question. Right? Who would be my guinea pigs? Now, I have to say that initially when I started this work, I was really just thinking about more like a kind of foundational conceptual level. I didn't expect, and it was what I'm going to report to you today, it actually ended up leads to quite theoretical results, and uh, some of them are a little bit unexpected. And uh, there is also a deep question that I don't have answer for it, and I'm really uh, here hope today uh, I can get some uh, inspirations from all of you. So here is the real title, and this article has been published uh, just last year in the special issues in JASA on the pre precision medicine and individualized policy discovery. I in encourage you to read that whole issue, but I can promise you my article is probably the most theoretical one. We, had the, we have tons of asymptotics there, and, and, and you will see. 
uh, uh, you know, what that means. And as I said, that I started thinking about this line of work about 10 years ago. The first article I wrote was in this COPS volume. I really talked about three kinds of problems. This is one is, is in this idea of multiple resolution. The idea is that individuals is become the highest resolution you can think of. Okay, I'm going to formulate mathematically what do I mean by uh, resolution. But in the same article, I also talk about the, the other two kinds of problems, which I think uh, you know, increasingly become very important. One is called a multi-source problem. You have data from different sources, and it's not just they have different size, they have different quality, different, different kinds, different variety. How do you combine them, right? That's the one kind of big problem. The other is what I call multi-phase problem. I think we already have heard quite a bit of today uh, in terms of this pipeline, because now the data science is done not by someone like just collect the data, analyze data. There's a Whole through whole a process of being you know privatized, processed, adjusted for fairness in you know, all kind of pre-processing by the end of time that you analyze it. Well, you better to take into account all these things have done. How do I do that? What's the mathematical model? I mean, statisticians always assuming everything IID, right? And the IID is completely off, off the chart here. That's irrelevant. Okay. So that's another two kinds of problem. I'm actually te teaching a course at Harvard at this moment, which has a very cliche title called Deep Statistics. You probably know where I got the title and try to talk about these, these, these three, uh, three kind of multi-faceted uh, uh, problem. And <clears throat> then I used that concept with a, a wonderful student of mine, Kelly Liu, Harvard undergraduate student, and absolutely wonderful that we apply this concept to the Simpson Paradox, because Simpson Paradox, for those who understand it, is about how you analyze data at the different levels and get different answers. So the multi-resolution comes in right away. How do you think about that? And then we really take this whole idea of thinking about inference itself. Taking every inference problem is like treating a patient. How do I know everything about that particular patient? This is very much like what Mike said today about thinking all the individual problems when you need to deal with that. So, uh, but today I'm going to really focusing on this, uh, this, this theoretical framework of thinking about multi-resolution and uh, uh, a big picture about uh, data science, and it's, it's, it's such a coincidence, and we did not, Mike and I, we did not really uh, uh, coordinate, but I'm going to quote uh, Mike's uh, quote here. I want to just say, you know, Mike has done many, many things, but there's one thing that was not mentioned, and I'm glad that I have this quote for, for him to hear. Mike did a lot for education as well. Uh, the, probably you, you guys all know the Data 8. Uh, that was the, a quote from the article Mike wrote for the Harvard Data Science Review. And, uh, uh, and this particular quote I, I put here is uh, because uh, Michael and, and his co-author basically emphasize like, you know, what's the difference between now and, and before, right? Statisticians or others have been collecting data all the time. What makes us really like the data science era? The point being made here, I, when I saw that, I said it's just perfect for, for, for my talk, right? Now we are now in, in position of data about specific phenomena. Okay, and it, what's important is Mike listed this, all these different examples. In genomics, we have data about each individual gene. It's not even each new person, each of the genes. And in astronomy, we have data about each regional sky. I mean, these are like a smaller scale and the larger scale, but they're all individual in, in, in this big, big content, right? And in medicine, we have data about each tumor, and in social science, we have data about individual humans, right? Or areas about data and about specific content, and in that sense, this whole data science is, right? So I just thought, so why don't we start thinking about these, these all different scales problems we're gonna work on? What I'm emphasizing to you is almost every problem we work on involves multiple resolutions, okay? Because there's always aggregation, there's always blurring the picture in order to get something out of too much, no uh, too much noises here. Okay, so uh, this notion of, uh, if I can move forward, okay. So the promise of big data is many of the treatment for you based on data from people like you, right? That, that's great. But there's a problem is no one is perfectly like you, okay? Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully each of you is unique. Even you have a twin sister, twin brothers, you're still unique, right? So uh, I think that this whole notion is absolutely relevant these days when you think about all the uh, you know, population risk versus individual risks. Anytime we think about risks, I think it's still on our mind. You know, we wear uh, you know, masks, that means you, you have some concerns. And, uh, but all the data we have pretty much is all population uh, uh, statistics. Right? Every time, this is, this is exactly the point Mike made today, when you make a decision or things, you start have thinking about, you know, I'm not just an average person. Hopefully not, right? That's my age, my, my medical condition, do I exercise enough, you know, so on and so forth, right? So the, the issue here is, how do you define the individuality? Now, uh, 
to, to me, I, when I start off thinking about, because I know there's a long literature about a large P, small n, I'm going to say a few words today. I feel that framework itself needs some work, OK? And uh, I'm going to really push this idea, say, the mathematical model we should think about when we talk about individualizations, we should think about P potentially is infinity, right? Now you say, well, there's nothing in the world is, is, is really you know, infinity. Well, on the other hand, we, mathematically, we use infinity to model something is indefinitely large. If you start thinking about individual, individuality, right, how do I define who I am? Particularly in this mod, medical content, it's not even my biological entity. My, my family history matters, right? You know, if I have data from my parents, you know, that matters, right? So if you start thinking about your entire ancestor matters, your environment matters, right? So you start thinking about it's really the P gets larger and larger. And I feel like why don't we allow one model to say the P potentially is, it, it, is infinity. If there, if there are many covariates turn out to be not relevant, that's fine. They're zero, right? Just conceptually, I want to set down the P equal to infinity. Now, I'm also pushing the other way end. Well, I'm claiming the end, the data, actually you have zero sample size because I can't collect any data from you, okay? So I'm basically saying that the hardest problem ever. Your P is infinity and N is zero. We can all go home, okay? That's, uh, that's initially when I set up this say, well, shout, is this useful? This seems like a completely, I mean, it's, it's kind of fun to contemplate that notion. It's surprisingly that actually gets you quite far and I'm trying to convince you this is actually a useful framework. And it's not even new, okay? I will show you there are lots of uh, mathematical connection with other fields. All right, so, uh, so the, the concept here is that we're essentially trying to move in from a population level soft matching to individual level the hard matching. If you think about, now the notion here, the idea here is it's no longer about, you know, take a population, I take some sample, right? St statistics, for most part of it, is about take a sample, infer something about the population, right? This goes the other way around. If I truly take an individual seriously, I need to collect the data from a, a, a kind of approximate proxy population and to learn about me, right? If I, if I, take, if I take that serious. Now, of course, people will say, Charlie, you know, you're, you're being a bit you know, too obnoxious. We don't take ourselves this seriously. We don't take a thing about individuals this unique. You obviously need to blur somewhere. Then my question is, where? How do you decide what is individuality? Right? It turned out to be a really philosophical question. Now, this is the one thing I want to remind this, this group, particularly the, 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 the younger population. Mike is uh, asking everybody to read more about you know, economic literature. I think that's very important. I also want to push everyone to read more about the philosophical literature. Okay? Because they are the one really sort, we're thinking about. They're not solving any problem, but they're thinking hard about all the problems that cannot be quantified, cannot be measured. I don't know how to measure. Individuality is one of them. Okay, and uh, uh, but uh, we have a mathematical way of trying to think about it, at least. Okay, so in this framework, the most important trade-off, which is just the notion of bias variance trade-off, but uh, framed differently, is the relevance and the robustness trade-off. Relevance means that whatever the population I find, whatever the answer I find, it will, in the end, whatever I get in the average answer is relevant for me. In, for that purpose, I need to match as many attributes as possible, right? Okay, in order to be relevant to me. But the problem with that, your sample size just keep going down. So the answer is very not robust in the sense the sampling variability is very high. On the other hand, you can just match a few things. Like for me, match my age, match, match my gender. There, there, there are tons of people out there, right? And the answer you get will be pretty robust because it's a large sample, big data. But why that's relevant to me, right? And I have a real experience. Now, that experience itself can take uh, two hours to, to, to talk about. I suffer kidney stones. Okay? When I, and, and so when I went to an uh, you know, emergency room, you know, the doctor, you know, after they've discovered I have a kidney stone, they really said, great, because you know, I was in extreme pain. When in extreme pain, people get worried. They gave me CT, everything right away. But once they discovered it was, it was kidney stone, they said, oh, fine. Kidney stone is not going to kill you. And the doctor told me, said, well, you know, According to what we read, uh, very careful how they collect data, according to what we read, you have uh, two thirds of chance that the stone will pass on your own. Okay? Great. Well, the only problem is I'm a statistician, so I'm asking them, where do your data come from? This is average of what? <laughs> they turn out to be, they, the person said, I read it somewhere. Talk to your specialist. So I talked to my specialist. 
my uh, this uh, this urologist and the urologist told me say yeah you well you can say well he said, you are in a, you're in a, in a very lucky case I said what what do you mean by that he said well what data show that if your stone size is uh, above uh, 5.5 millimeter your chance pass on your own is about one third if it's below it it's about two thirds there's some kind of phase transition going on there nobody knows why probably is the you know whatever the size of your tubes you know and uh, but it, he said, well, but your stone is about six millimeters. So it all depends on how the radiology reads the thing. There's a, there's a measurement error, you know, for me, right? And eventually, you know, I've just, there's a long story that, that you know, I, I asked him, what is the risk? If the, he encouraged me to do the surgery. And I said, what's the risk of doing the surgery? A, a complication. He said, 2%. Well, I'm thinking about like a 2% from whom, right? But then I'm asking, so if I don't do it, there will be a complication. Well, it would leave scars. They could be, you know, block you. You could be in the emergency room. And I ask him, what's the risk of that? He said, 2%. <laughs> I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> and in both cases, he just said, well, these are average of something else, right? And the worst part was, uh, later, you know, I, I decided not to take a surgery, wait a little bit. And after six months, he said, you really should take surgery because you're going to have all the danger. Then I said, okay, what's the data on people did not take surgery after six months? He said, well, we don't have any data. The only data we have are on dogs. You know, that, that was the data you'll be used, right? It's a really, uh, Mike's a, you know, question about you know, how this thing's being relevant. So the question here is that, uh, um, I basically spent all my time, I can go now, right? So the, the, the how are you thinking about these problems that how do you collect the relevance data? Okay, so now let me get to the um, more, um, if I can move this. It turned out that this is not a new, no, new notion. I'm sure every one of you in your, in your life have made a decision by using some uh, proxy data. This turned out to be a notion really from, from Greek. Uh, this uh, Galen, uh, probably the uh, most well-known philosopher and the and the Asian surgeon had this notion called the transition to the similar. Okay? And this actually turned out to be has a, has a, a formal term in, in the philosopher is called a transitional inference. Okay? The transitional inference is, is a really a kind of an empiricism concept, concept. And here is a, a quote what Galen wrote, obviously translated. And I thought it was in, incredibly interesting because this one quote shows that Galen was both a Bayesian and a frequentist long before these terms were ever you know, even known, right? So this is what Galen said. In cases in which there's no history or in which there's none of sufficient similarity, there's not much hope, okay? He's basically saying, he's like thinking like a Bayesian, right? You need some prior information. If without it, uh, there's not much hope. And the same thing is true in the case of transference of one remedy from one element to another similar to it. One has a greater or smaller basis for expectation of success in proportion to the increase or decreasing similarity of the element, whether or not history is involved. That's a very frequent statement, right? Thinking about how often in the past, you know, things have worked and that gets transferred here, right? And uh, it's also interesting, that another, and the same goes for the transference from one part of the body to another part. Expectation of success varies in direct proportion to the similarity, right? This is Galen, okay? This is basically lay out all, everything we're doing, like my doctor was doing similar things, right? Thinking about how similar I am to others and you know, do those things. The question in here, this got me really interested, is that how can I put down some mathematical formulation for this? How can I study this seriously? I mean, philosophy is great. Right? I have all these ways of thinking about. But our job is kind of make them more quantitative, at least have ways to study. So that's essentially uh, what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to convince you that there's a lot need to be done here. Um, OK, let's see more, more forward. OK, first of all, let's, let's, let me talk about inference and prediction as approximation. All right? So what do we really want to know? Think about the classic uh, you know, uh, counterfactual. Uh, framework for causal inference, right? If we have two treatments, what I really wanted to know is not, uh, uh, you know, giving one group or giving another group. I want to know if I give you treatment A, how you will react. If I give you treatment B, how you will react. And I want to know the difference. That's the classic counterfactual name and grouping framework, right? Okay, you guys know that. Oh, great. Now, of course, we, what we know is we don't know any of those, but we have a bunch of other people who are not me. Some of them we get their treatment A, some of them get in treatment B, right? So that's a classic notion. And uh, now what we want to do is we want to study, we want to have a strategy constructed population of relevant individuals 
with which to approximate you. So, okay, that's what I'm saying. This has been, no longer become a kind of inference problem, become approximation problem. Okay, because I know there's no, it's not like, you know, nobody, there's no notion of unbiased estimator, okay? No notion of consistent estimator. There's, there's not even data, not even, uh, not even direct data, right? Okay. So, uh, so the, the, the whole notion of resolutions, what I borrowed is from the literature of uh, uh, wavelets. You know, for the engineers, you're very familiar with that because I was working on, on this uh, picture, you know, color schemes. And if you think about a, a picture, right, you literally have this pixel level, right? And you know, you know that if you zoom in too much, you lost seeing the big picture. If you zoom too out, you will lost seeing the picture either. You want to find the right level of resolution. That's the, that's the framework I'm borrowing here. Okay, you can see why the, the, the mathematics might, you, you know, might, you know, might work. The, the important thing is that you want to find a subpopulation. You want to match on something what are called an intrinsic characteristic. You need to make sure they're pretreatment to ensure there's, a, there, uh, there's no confounding factor. Um, so in the literature of uh, you know, these multi-resolution, particularly wavelets, you have this notion called the prime, primary resolution, right? Anything above that resolution and anything that is lower than that resolution, you call them signal because they're slow varying. Anything higher, you, you use them as noise, right? That's the kind of a, a resolution specific you know, study. And so just schematically, what we're trying to do is just thinking about an individual is you, and this is a relevant individual. What you're trying to match is above this, this notion that everything matches, and below, you, know, you can let it, let it vary, okay? So that's where you stop. You define the similarity by the resolution level, if you have a way to define the resolution levels. Okay, you probably can start seeing how I may get into mathematics itself. Okay, all right. So here is basically a multi-resolution view of the big data. Is you know you, we should really try to zoom in as much as possible. It's 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 again uh, 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 really consistent with what Mike is saying in terms of making these in individual decisions. In um, okay, so so here is the how do we capture the re resolution? Now I'm going to get get into a little bit of mathematics, and there are some really interesting question. A kind of a remind me of, but because this mathematic framework. Well, imagine that you have an information fil uh, filtration, okay, which is just a list of uh, you know uh, a sigma field or or you know sub sigma field, right? So this is the general formulation. I have a list of them. I have infinite many. Of them. The only thing is they have order, okay? So as I condition on more and more these information, that the sigma field, I get more and more information, right? So that is if so that resolution will be defined by this system. It's just a few information filtration, okay? The question then is, how do I choose R? Now, one simplest way, I want to emphasize this is that one, all the results we have is with respect to the simplest way, which is just think, think about you have infinite many uh, attributes, and then you just start to say the first R generated, the FR is the sigma field generated by first R. You don't have to do this way, okay? You could say first one is all the first, all the many effects, the second is all the second order, the third is you know, adding, well, you can do that, do that as well. And also you don't have to every time only adding one, you could add, add a bunch of them. The whole idea is you have a sequence, then that's fine, okay? How you define a sequence, that's problem specific, but I want to see, using this to show generally how do you think about multi-resolution. And it turned out to also really have come up, uh, leads to a different way to define, define, spa, uh, define the sparsity, okay? So, uh, so R here is index of resolution. Now, uh, let me just take a very, very simple uh, framework, uh, which I should be very familiar to any uh, statisticians, engineers, right? I'm gonna say the signal at any particular resolution is simply the, is simply the condition mean. Why given that thing? And the noise at that level is the variance, conditional variance, okay? I'm doing L2, everything's incredibly simple, but that's surprisingly is already go pretty, pretty far, okay? Because I don't define what this sigma field is. All right, okay, so now what do I do? Well, as a statistician, when I see this, ANOVA decomposition, right? Okay, so let's do the ANOVA decomposition. All right, so this is the simplest ANOVA decomposition, right? At any R level, the uh, conditional variance is the average of the conditional variance at the higher level and the difference between the two condition mean. This is basically saying, you know, anything that is not captured by my level up, up that contributes to, to, the, uh, you, you know, to the variance. So the really most interesting thing, which turned out to be really critical, is, is the following thing. Well, first, first this is just a, this is just said, a, this is like the bias of the model, because you do not use enough resolution, what's the bias in the conditional mean, right? So that's the magnitude of signal resolution, not a model by, uh, by the resolution. 
And here is the really interesting one, right? You can keep writing this one, right? There's nothing to stop you keep writing, going, you know, telescopically write that to, to, to infinity. This formula gives me lots of things to think about. I, I literally look at, uh, you know, I literally look at this thing, you know, for, for a few days, trying to understand this, because this is a, this is a very simple one. When you write, you, you run into the following thing, okay? There are two things you realized. This is the variance, right? Okay? These are all biases, right? In this formulation, you will see there's really no such thing called a variance. Variance is all biases. It's all the biases you have not accumulated, you have not included in the model, except at the infinity level. There could be an intrinsic variance. It could mean that even if you learn everything about that patient, entire history, everything about medical science, everything, the God still in the end flip a coin to determine the treatment outcome. So that's kind of a, so if we believe, right, this really reminds me, uh, we, we have people in the audience, or actually I'm going to survey since I'm stat statisticians, how many of you would believe the world is stochastic? Meaning that even after you learn everything, right, there's still something cannot be de de determined. How many of you believe that? All right, okay, we see a few hands. Okay, great, all right. That's... Now, on the other hand, if you set this guy equals to zero, you, you then all the uncertainty, all the randomness is just because of our lack of knowledge. We have not studied hard enough. Right? Okay. So that's a deterministic world. How many of you believe the world is deterministic? Wonderful. Okay. So now you guys can have, start have a debate about okay, which is which. Now here's the funny part, and this is the this is the question that I really pose to to this this audience, and I particularly pose to Mike because Mike knows the answer to everything. Uh, um, well, I guess everybody would agree. There's no way there's ever empirical data you can test this guy, whether zero or not. So in my initial formulation, I decide, well, it doesn't really matter, right? I'm, I'm just going to set it to do zero. Or I do whatever I want to do. That turned out to be really wrong, OK? Whether I set this equal to zero has real consequences, all right? I'm going to show you. Mathematically provable consequences, as well as in, in particular simulations, you can show their consequences. I still don't quite understand this one. So this is why I want you to start thinking about. How come something there's no way to test it anyway in any finite amount of data can it have a, a kind of footprint in the real uh, in the thing? Okay, I'm going to show you what the, the, what that thing is. But let me so first now uh, thinking about this uh, resolution formulation. The resolution formulation, is, since n sample size is not even uh, uh, you know a real one in, in a sense, it's a you know it's an indirect sample size. The way you think about it is instead of n go to Infinity of where can n go to zero essentially is r goes to infinity. You think about resolution goes to infinity. Okay, so you can see how the mathematics is set up because something goes to infinity, you know you have some mathematics to do, right? You guys know this. Okay, uh, but this actually really tells you that you can think about think about the individual prediction here, right? Why mean is the outcome that after the treatment, however God decide I I have the treatment. This is my prediction. How did I do prediction? I take a group of people. Right? Okay? I learn a model, do some fancy deep learning, I learn from the model, right? But I, whatever I do, there is a resolution that I need to choose because I can't use the infinite resolution, right? So whatever the resolution you use, there is a resolution bias, which essentially is a model selection bias, okay? But there's also estimation problem, right? Whatever at the that level I need to learn, then I have the, that's a variance problem. On top of that, there's this intrinsic variance. That depends on whether you are determinist person or stochastic person. So this is essentially the one decomposition, put everything together. Uh, estimation, model selection, you know, whatever, whatever you want to think about. OK. So I do use different, uh, different notations, hat for the use at usual estimation, 2D for, you know, for, you know, for, for, for the selection. So the holy grail statistical inference prediction problem is how big should this R be, right? What is it? So like, this is not anything different from the bias variance trade-off thinking, except that this framework, because I allow myself to have the infinite level uh, variance equal to zero, that turned out to be there is a world is called the world of no, no bias variance trade-off, which is very ironic for me to say because all my colleagues, my student knows I'm always talking about bias variance trade-off, okay? The reason there's no bias variance trade-off because there's no, no variance to start with. So it's a still bias variance trade-off except the variance is zero, right? Okay. So, all right. So mathematically, this is really the, uh, very similar to the uh, non-parametric sieve method. You can use sieve method. You're going to 
treated the parameter space ex expanding to deal with infinite dimensional. Uh, it's, it's for non uh, uh, you know, pro uh, parametric estimation. Okay, so now let me give you uh, two models. Uh, one is a linear model, one is a discrete tree model. One is a tree with in infinite depths, the other is a linear system with, with infinite many predictors. And uh, so here is, the, here is the setup, right? So let's say you, you have a model, uh, it's y equal to the linear, and you know, for this, for the simplicity, I'm even for the simple one, it already have some surprise. I'm gonna assume everything is like ID normal, okay? And the, the key is that after this infinite system, I can still have epsilon, I still can have a tau square, right? Okay, there's nothing stop you doing that, except you realize the sum of these beta squares has to converge, right? Otherwise, it's not even a, a proper model. That's actually, there's a very important implication in terms of these large piece, small n type of thinking, okay? So suppose like I take any particular R, I do a, using L2 and I do the least square as you know, in estimation. And the least square estimation the, it's, it itself has three, three parts, variability. There's the intrinsic error, right? That's nobody can do anything, that's the intrinsic error. And then there is this, this is the, like a residual error. The AI is essentially saying, after you first fit the first R variable, how much predicted error you still have. So that's a monotone decrease function, right? And essentially, you know, in the familiar, in, in a normal case, you can just write the difference of these conditional, conditional variance, okay? In broadly, you know, of course, that's, uh, that's, that's more complicated. So this is the one I want you to, to look at, okay? This one turned out to be incredibly important. And in fact, in our first version article, we actually overlooked this. It turned out this has a, a, such a juicy story. Because everything normal, you can calculate what is the, uh, what is the errors in, in my estimation, okay? For, you know, for, uh, for, uh, you know, for the beta. If you look at this expression, n is sample size, tau square is in, in the intrinsic variance, ar is the residual error, and n is the sample size. All right? Now, this is something, remember we all talk about don't overfit, right? Okay. So we know that you know, usually the r should not close to n because the numerator the denominator is going to blow up, right? And the ar always go to zero, by definition, if you keep adding things. Now you can see why, whether tau equal to zero or not make a difference. If a tau is bigger than zero, no matter how tiny it is, you're gonna have overfitting problem. Where the R goes to N, this thing is gonna blow up. But if a tau square is zero, remember AR goes to zero as well. You have two things go to zero, it's a zero over zero. I don't have to convince this, this audience. There are ways to have zero over zero, the damn thing still go to zero. And you don't overfit, okay? And so that is, okay, it's, it's all here, right? So now let me talk about, uh, because of that, we now can recover all these double descent, multiple descent pretty easily. But I also have a point to, to make. This is a, a paper uh, uh, by uh, uh, Travis Hesty and, and, and uh, Ryan uh, uh, Tipperani. And they you know, show that in these cases, they, 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 they show that you know, by now, like I guess most people understand, there is this, this phenomenon. There are this phenomena, you know, when you're close to this gamma, which is P over N, right? The, 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 the P, their P is, is my R, okay? They use, they think of the P as the entire model. And then you will see that, you know, because the denominator is close to one, uh, close to P1, it could close to N, so this thing will, will blow up, then afterwards you, you have this phenomenon. I first want to make a comment, and, and uh, I've been making a comment to many people. I, I don't think this actually makes much sense to plot over P over N. Okay, it's just because I don't, first I don't believe that nature will change its model just because of how much data we collect. But there's a more serious point is that when you have P and N both changing, like when you have the same gamma, they actually have very different meanings, right? And of course, you know, you, you know here, so by putting them on the equal footing, you are comparing models really with different, different flavors. For example, if you really having one gamma, if gamma, go, gamma goes up and the P is, is a fixed, the N has to go down, right? You will have all these issues. But the way we do it, basically the P is, is, is in infinity, we use the R as our working parameter, working model, but that's fine. You can do, do whatever you want. But because of our understanding of that particular model, now we can create this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this thing quite easily, right? Because you know, if we have this uh, uh, AR, we can create those things quite easily because if you're adding variables, right? If you're adding important variables, then afterwards, you're adding a bunch of you know, irrelevant variables. You will increase the estimation errors, but not really reducing that 
uh, that, you know, that prediction error. But once you're adding more variables, then, then things will go down, right? So once you understand that particular thing, you can create, you know, you, we basically create uh, any kind of a multiple descent as much as you want, right? Just because you just, keep, you, I mean, you can keep doing that. And, uh, but here is the interesting, uh, so, so that was the first part, and I'm gonna show you that the overall, uh, you know, asymptotical results. What we're trying to do is, after we set up and say, what is the optimal, what's the optimal choice of the R? Okay, how that related to, uh, to the sample size. So the first one was the, was the continuous case, uh, uh, you know, uh, linear regression. This essentially is an infinite tree, okay, infinite depth of tree. And everything, the, the one thing we did in this version, we're just assuming all things are, you know, uh, uh, you know Ben Nulli. Uh, in, in reality, you don't have to assume that. The mathematics is a little bit, little bit more, little bit more, uh, more complicated. And in this case, that you need to worry about uh, what we call the properties. If it, because the infinite tree, it's an infinite kind of a, a, a dimension, you know, a, a, you know, a contingent table. You will have cells has no observation in it. So when you do this training, everything you need to actually put in what do we call the highest, uh, highest resolution imputation. You go down the resolution. If it's not enough, you go down to, until you find enough so, so you plug in. Uh, this may or may not be the best thing to do, but we did enough mathematics to, to, to show that's actually, uh, it's, it's actually really quite interesting. So here is the, uh, okay, in this case, you can also decompose the errors. I'm not going to go to detail. There are three, three, three levels just because their cells has, has, has zero uh, you know, you know, zero observations. But the most important thing I want to share with you is is these asymptotic results because they're they're they're, they're a little surprised there. Okay, so here is that in the first case that is the is the uh, stochastic case, we leave the tau square bigger than zero. Okay, in which case that we think about three type of uh, decay of AR. AR is the residual error. We think about the exponential decay. That's essentially say it's very sparse. But only fuels are important, okay? Uh, polynomial decay and, and the log decay. We also think about what is the estimation error there. It depends on how many parameters there. It depends on whether it's continuous, which you know, if, if it's a two-way two -way interaction, this will be two. And this is the categorical ones, how many levels of, so, so you get this, this expansion going. And R here is what is the optimal choice of the, of the resolution? And L, what's the optimal rate of prediction you can achieve? Is that clear? Okay. So this is a case when tau squared is bigger than zero. And nothing really surprising here. Basically saying that if you have exponential decay, your behavior is pretty much like a parametric model. We did not put the parametric model here. Parametric model essentially is saying that decay is, is, is a hard threshold. Afterwards, it's zero, okay? So you only give up a, a kind of a log, you know, log term if exponential decay, okay? You pretty much can treat it. If it's a polynomial decay, now you get to this kind of a non parametric rate. It like, depends on kind of smoothness kind of parameter, thing, right? If, if it's a log rate, it's hopeless. You, you can't learn, learn much. Then this is the, for the continuous case, for the linear model. And this, this one actually does not really require the linear model as long as the arrow has that structure. This one is for the infinite tree model. The, the optimal R itself, when you have fast decay, you only need to log n order in terms of the optimal R. You don't need to pick too many of them. Right? That's kind of, kind of intuitive. And you, uh, you achieve essentially that kind of non-parametric rate. Okay? You, you never get a parametric rate because this is the, remember this infinite, uh, you know, infinite you know, depth of tree. And, and here's our particular hopeless. Basically, it's saying that in those cases that uh, essentially, you know, these are the cases that you probably can still learn something. And these are hopeless cases. Okay? That is if a tau squared is bigger than zero. That is if the world is stochastic. Well, guess what happens when the world is deterministic, all right? When the world is deterministic, if it allows me to show that, well, I guess too much surprise, it doesn't allow me to go there. Okay, that's deterministically stuck. Can someone help to, okay, great. In a deterministic world, it's very interesting, right? First, that if you have exponential decay, then you can overfit. Essentially saying that your optimal R can be as close to n as possible minus some constant. The constant has to be less than or equal to three, okay? You know, you, you cannot get it too close to this. And your rate is exponentially decay rate, right? So this is, you learn a lot, right? Well, if you think about it, it's not hard because you're solving equations. If you're deterministic, you're solving equations. Every single relationship is a hard data for you, but only when the residual error decay fast enough. Otherwise, these religious error, they serve almost like this. These pseudo deterministic error serves like random error, okay? And uh, 
it's interesting that if you do if you do polynomial decays, then you get that kind of uh, you certainly do better than depends on what the decay rate is. You can do better than one of n. Okay. Uh, but once it, by the time the, even by the time the log is kind of hopeless, once you take a log is is hopeless. And uh, this is the linear model in the regression in, in the trees that we really can get this kind of uh, optimal rate. That, that this is a really surprising part for the infinite dimensional tree, infinite deficit tree. We can essentially get the parametric kind of rate. One of n. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is really quite you know quite surprising. But here here you got all you know all these small rate. Now let me uh, in the last two minutes let me show you actually a simulation results. Get us stuck again. Must. Be. Oh, uh, I don't have time to really, well, I maybe go very quickly. You know, there's ordering issue, right? I put a variable in particular order. So how do you, how these order matters? Uh, this is the interesting results that these orders obviously matters, but it, it basically the results says, can some help to advance it? I think. It basically, the ordering results said that if you have fast exponential decay, you can make lots of mistakes in the ordering. Oh, no, sorry. If it's a fast decay, you cannot make lots of uh, mistakes. Mistake can be it's the only small amount of mistake you, you, you can make. Otherwise, you can destroy uh, this thing. But if you really have, if you have exponential decay, you can only make, thank you. Does that mean I can have another hour? Oh. Okay. Wait, this is, even, no, this one's not fun. This one does not have the, uh, a pointer. Uh, so basically saying that in, if you have uh, if you have exponential decays that you can only allow yourself to have make a finite number of uh, mistakes in order to maintain the optimal rate okay but if you have polynomials you can the mistake can be almost up to the but you know as long as then like less one the last result is both a kind of a fun results but it's also useless results basically if you have logarithm decay make any number of mistakes is fine first you may think that's a robust no it's saying hopeless okay nothing works and in fact, this is actually a real phenomenon. I was talking to one of my colleagues. I explained this results, re, result to him. And he reminded me, he said, oh, yeah, in, the, in these gene studies, they have so many of uh, these genes, right? And they often find that uh, you know, whichever group of genes they, they use, that the predictive errors is, is very similar. Because you know, every gene contributes a little bit. There's no dominant ones there. Okay. So my last, uh, uh, OK, so let, now let me show you, show you this uh, numerical results. Then, uh, then I stop there. Um, this is the case that up that this is the three cases we do cross validation. So this is trying to see this is whole thing is not just theory. You can do we this, this is a true predictive curve. The, the black one, the cross validation is this uh, a blue one. There's a Stein unbiased estimate that kind of a, a you know a curve, and there's an information one which is completely useless except uh, later there's one case. These are the three cases where this is the exponential decay, polynomial decay. Uh, uh, log decay and uh, for the uh, you know for the linear model, okay. In all cases, you will see that the, the kind of mean square or predictive error curve has has a classical notion of going up. There's optimal choice of R here, okay. That's when tau square is bigger than zero. When tau square is equals to zero, here's what happens. Now for the exponential one, basically says keep fitting it. All right, you don't you don't pay a price. You you keep fitting it. And, uh, and this is the fact, even those ones I know it's not great, but you will see they, they start having the R is a little bit larger you know, in those cases. These eventually still become the classical ones. But this is the most interesting part, right? You know, why, why, why we can have this phenomenon? The notion that you have to have exponential decay. I have a, the second paper oh, I, I really should have said, uh, all the mathematical results due to Shen Run, okay? My job here is to explain it. Okay, uh, but seriously, that I'm working with him now to try to get when this uh, kind of a no overfitting phenomenon can happen. What's the if and only if condition on the decay rate? It turned out to be this is the exponential is a sufficient one, but not necessary. There's a little bit more nuance, and the the the, the notion is actually really quite interesting. We still cannot figure out. It, it has a almost like a, a dynamic iterative sequence that kind of condition. We're still trying to figure out what what it is. But it's very interesting that there is this phenomenon. Basically, said it's a system infinite is deterministic that depends on how much sparsity you assume. There is a region for which you can learn without being overfitting. All right. So now I'm going to stop here, but I'm going to generalize a perfect time. Then I said, well, what this reminds me that, you know, trying to thinking about all these algorithms, you know, deep learning, all these with tons, tons of parameters, why sometimes they 
seem like they cannot, they don't overfit, right? I, I started wondering, I think many of you know this well, that if you really have a very flexible system, if you really have lots of data, if the, if the machine, if the algorithm has memorized all the possible patterns, oh, most of these patterns can happen in practice, that is effectively is a deterministic, deterministic system. So next time I see it, it doesn't have to understand it, but it will be predicted with very small errors. So thank you very much. These are summary for people just to wake up, so. Any questions? Hi, so when you're talking about precision medicine, uh, you're talking from a statistics point of view. Um, what about the mechanism of action point of view? Because if you do have complete knowledge of all of that, then wouldn't that make the statistics point of view less relevant? Uh, yes and no, right? Because the, the, the only thing, it may make the high resolution less relevant because the decision space is typically very low resolution, right? Whether you treat it, not treat it, observe more, right? So there's lots of equivalent classes. That's essentially what, what, what saved us. Right. So, so my notion here is, is in terms of thinking, you know, talk to doctors or talk to uh, 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 these regulatory agencies, is that first, of all, what are we talking about when we say we have evidence to say this works? You need to think about like, what kind of evidence you're, you're collecting, right? Second, I think uh, FDA, whoever in the future want to label anything about being personalized, individualized, you need to say at what resolution, right? You need the notion at what degree. Now, of course, as, as uh, any doctor would tell you, uh, most doctors would tell you, we actually, Harvard Data Science Review is going to have a special issue called N of one trial, essentially, is, is talking about this issue. They would tell you, like, you know, all the personalized, we're far from it. But so that's why they call it pre precision medicine, right? It's just more precise than it used to be. I mean, in fact, we have been doing personalized medicine for thousand years. All the Chinese doctors, Chinese herb, you know, they're, they're all personalized. If anyone you have seen them, they, they do your pulse, they look at your tongue, they look at your face, you know, they do a machine learning algorithm in their mind, right? And, and that's what they do. It's a very personalized. They cannot replicate themselves. I, I've done this, right? I took my mother to see a doctor in the morning, see the same doctor in the afternoon, the, the thing is different, right? <laughs> I, I'm hoping my mother's condition does not change that fast, but, but uh, you know, because it is very personalized. This is just like doing on, on a large scale. What I'm hoping is to put a framework for us to think about this thing. But accidentally, I think we also have a framework thinking about me, uh, putting sparsity in terms of the uh, predictive error, you know, directly sparsity instead of using PO van. Thank you. Thank you.